Hello, welcome back to Chris's Creative Corner, Season 1, Episode 11. My name is Chris Cole, and I am a very small-time published author. What we're, what we're doing on the podcast is we're talking about my books, and we're reading through the books. It's kind of an alternative to sub- buying an audiobook. Instead, you just subscribe, and you get a chapter a week. Thought it was pretty interesting. We are currently going through the first romance that I wrote, a book called Porch Light. The second and third books that I wrote will be in seasons two and three. They will be Avoiding Aiden, and the third one will be Puppy Love. Um, I'm going in the order that I wrote them. So hopefully, as we go throughout the podcast, um, you can be like, oh, wow, he's improved so much, instead of like, what is he doing? He's so bad at this. Please stop. If you do think that, you can let me know, although I don't know how helpful it'll be because I'm not going to stop. Okay. I'm in a little bit of a mood today, so just be aware that I'm a little punchy. Um, first, we're going to go through questions for Chris. This is a segment where I answer questions from people who have sent me uh, messages, whether that's on TikTok, Facebook, whatever. Um, we get it figured out, and I answer the questions. Um, today's questions are interesting. What literary pilgrimages have you gone on? I assume this means like going to a place specifically for a book. And the answer is none because I'm a broke ass bitch. Um, at the same time, I have done some traveling. Um, I've traveled to Washington, D.C. So I live in southeastern Idaho, and I don't get out much. Um, So I traveled to Washington, D.C. in the late 2000s. Um, In the mid-2010s, in 2016, um, I traveled to Sitka, Alaska, which was amazing. I went there on my honeymoon. Um, and the weather, it was like, everything was just like perfect. The weather was like, oh, there are guests in Sitka. We better show them a good time. And it was just amazing. Um, I've also like, I've been to Disneyland a couple times, um, as a high schooler, I went there, um, on choir trips. Um, I've been to Vegas a few times. Um, and then I've traveled the region of Idaho. So I've been to Boise, Salt Lake City, um, Idaho Falls. Really, that's about all the travel I do because writing is pretty stationary. Um, Would I love to, like, go overseas, like, to England or something and explore there? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, Does that mean that I'm going to be able to afford it right now? No. Eventually, later, yes, I think I will, and I would love to travel. The big part of traveling is that it requires some kind of going someplace. Um, And there's the problem. Yeah. See, um, I'm a little bit of a homebody. And I don't like to fly. I have yet to experience... I've experienced, like, obviously entirely successful flights. There have been no problems whatsoever on any flights that I've ever been on. And I still get super nervous, probably because I watched, you know, movies like Final Destination. (sighs) And I did it on purpose, too. I don't I don't know why. So I'm afraid of flying, which is a big part of traveling is you fly to places, um, especially if you're going overseas. So that's why I've kind of started looking into potentially going on cruises I think that would be fun, like to take a Caribbean cruise or a Mexican cruise or a cruise to Hawaii or an Alaskan cruise. I would be down to do all of those. And I also recognize that I I don't want to be ruled by my fear, but I still want to be like cognizant of the fact that there's all these horror stories of like people getting stuck on cruise ships for various random diseases that they get while they're on the cruise ship. And I'm like, I I don't want to be quarantined because someone got parvo or so i don't know like some random disease that you know is gonna anyway long story short i have not taken any literary pilgrimages i have gone places through google maps as i've written about the places that i've let me try that again i have gone 
I've traveled through Google Maps and written about places that I've visited there. Um, because like, as we're talking about in Porchlight, um, he's gone to Nashville. And so I looked up Nashville on maps. I looked up pictures. I looked up all sorts of stuff about it. Um, and I would love to eventually go there and be like, oh yeah, this is the hotel I had in mind when I said that they were staying in a hotel. And oh, this is the airport. And oh, this is the music studio that doesn't actually exist. You know, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I would love to ultimately go on, I would love to go on literary pilgrimages. Um, it just requires financing that I don't have at this time. Yeah. Good question. I know that there are people like who go to destinations like, oh, I'm going to go to my little chateau in France to write the story. And I'm like, you're so lucky. Um, I'm so jealous. Stop it and take me with you all at the same time. Um, so that's always nice. I know that there are people who specifically go to places to write and that's like their writing space. I go to school. I go to home. I go to um, a local, local coffee house and like the college market. Um, I go there and I write there. So those are plenty of places. I write basically anywhere I am. It just happens to be a lot of times in the city I live <laughs> in Southeast Idaho. So that's awesome. Um, the next question is, what is the first book that made you cry? I'm trying to remember if there were any kid books that I remember crying over. What did I read as a kid? I know that I've cried at books. I'm just trying to remember what the first book was. Um, was it... I think it might have been an Animorphs book, actually. Um, the series has been around long enough for anybody who doesn't know. Like, you can go and read what I'm talking about. Um, but it actually made me cry when Marco's mother, who had been taken over by an alien, was finally freed and reunited with her husband. And... Even like as a teenager, I was like, oh, this is so beautiful. I know for sure um, I cried in the seventh book of Harry Potter. And I definitely cried multiple times in the series of unfortunate events. So there's also, there's also this book, I can't remember who wrote it, called This Is How It Ends. And I bought it at a time when there were like a lot of school shootings happening. It's not like they're not a lot happening now, but it seemed like we were having just, you know, an overabundance of people using guns to kill people in schools, which is, you know, fantastic because freedom. Um, anyway, and I bought this book um, called This Is How It Ends, and it was about a school shooting, and I tore through it in one sitting and it took me maybe six hours to read or something like that. I don't remember. I don't remember exactly how long it took me to read it, but I read through it in one sitting and was just sitting here like shook and traumatized because of it. And that was one that I bought on purpose, knowing that I was going to be emotional about it. And I bought it with the idea that I was going to like use it to be like, yes, I can advocate more for, you know, gun safety and that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, nothing changed when I did that. So that was nice. Anyway, so the first book, the first book that made me cry that I wasn't expecting it was Animorphs. Um, and I can't remember what number that was. It was near the end. And, hmm... It might have been, actually, it might have been an earlier one. I know there was, like, I owned and read, like, it was, like, 30, like, the mid-30s of the Animorph series. And there was one, I think it was number 35, where Marco gets completely overwhelmed because his dad m has been dating this woman who just happens to be, like, his math teacher. And she has this awful poodle named Euclid. Um, I think is how you say it. E-U-C-L-I-D. 
um, is how you spell it. That's how I read it in my head. I've never actually heard the name out loud. So maybe that was the first time I've actually said it. Euclid. It just sounds ill. Um, and I was really drawn to his struggle, Marco's struggle with them, like being ha his dad being happy and that kind of thing. And so it might've been one of those, but it was definitely an Animorphs book. So yeah, that was the first book that made me cry. Um, since then, I have read books on purpose that I knew would make me cry, but that was the one that I was least expecting it because I was like, this is sci-fi. What the heck? Sci-fi is not supposed to make you feel things. And then I'm writing sci-fi where I'm like, feel things, feel things. Woo. Anyway. Do, do, do. So now we're going to move on and start our chapter for the day, um, for the week. Chapter 11, Lonely and alone. I woke up in the hotel bed early the next morning before my wake-up call. I laid there for a few minutes, wondering why the hell my body decided it was time to wake up when my phone dinged. I looked at the screen and saw it was 6 a.m. I opened it to find a picture of Casey, face turned comically sad, lying shirtless in bed, his arms spread out to the empty side of the bed where I'd been sleeping. His message said, can't sleep. I typed out a message. I was sleeping just fine till you woke me up, bitch. He replied a moment later. It's amazing how used to sleeping with someone you can get. Maybe I'll get a puppy. I'm a much better cuddler than a puppy. I have hands for massages and stuff, too. He sent a winky face emoji. I would love a massage right now. I shook my head, frowning at my phone. I couldn't tell if he was drunk or not. I chanced a message. If I were there, I would totally give you a massage. I waited several minutes for a reply. Finally, he sent me a message. But you're not. Guess I'll have to find a hot girl to massage me. Oh, darn. I see how it is. Just replace me then. See if I care. He replied with a gif of Beyonce singing Irreplaceable. My heart melted. Even though that's not really what the song was about, I still understood and appreciated it. I got up and went down for breakfast. Recording that day was difficult. I kept coming in too early or too late. Can we do that again? Omar rubbed his temples behind the glass. I'm sorry. I grabbed a quick sip from my water bottle. I'm really trying. I'm just so used to the live band. Omar forced a smile. It's all right. Just really focus. Really focus. It took the rest of the afternoon until I got the one track down and was able to record vocals like they wanted. It was hard work. My voice was not happy. I was definitely going to be resting it tonight. As I was leaving, Omar told me to plan on another week. Tentatively plan, but to let people know who needed to know. You really think it's going to take another week? He sighed. I get that you're new, which is why I'm giving you more time. It's not bad you have a learning curve. You can't expect to be perfect. I nodded. Sorry. I guess I just have high expectations of myself. He raised his eyebrows. Don't we all? Anyway, take the evening to relax. Let's start a little later tomorrow. Give your voice some time to warm up naturally. I can hear your voice is tired. I called Sandy that night and got her voicemail. Hey, lady, it's Nick. Junior. Um, so listen, the album is taking a little longer to finish, and it looks like I'm going to have to be here two weeks instead of one. I'm really sorry to leave you in a lurch. It wasn't my intention. If you need anything, just call me, okay? Thanks. Mm, bye. Then I sent off a text to each of my bandmates. Kennedy replied first. Hurry up. I want to get that album out so we can go on tour. I'm sick of working in this fucking bakery. Levi replied with a thumbs up. Typical. Casey replied with a sad face. So you're out of town for another week? Bummer. It's all quiet and stuff. I've gotten used to helping your crippled ass around. I sent him a middle finger emoji and typed out, I miss you, before I stopped. I deleted it. I've gotten used to you too. No, 
delete. Finally, I sent him just the middle finger emoji. He replied with a grinning picture of him flipping me off. From the background, I could see he was at a bar, so I could expect some drunk text tonight. Great. But the evening was quiet. I watched some videos online of bands I aspired to be like, wrote some song lyrics, and drank tea with lemon and honey to soothe my throat. Sandy called the next morning when I was on my way to the studio. Good morning, Sandy. Hey, listen, we've got a problem. I really do need you back. I sighed. I had hoped there wouldn't be issues. She was going to hassle me. Sandy, I'm so sorry, but I'm stuck in Nashville at least until the 21st. What am I going to do about your shifts? You need to find coverage. I felt my temper rise. I can't really do that when I'm in Nashville. Could you ask Bethany to do it? I fired her. The taxi pulled up to the studio. I handed him the money and clumsily stepped outside. I was glad I'd brought my headphones. Holding a phone and being on crutches is impossible. I've tried it. Well, I'm really sorry. I'll let you know when I'm on my way back. Hopefully it doesn't take the full two weeks. Her voice rose over the phone. Junior, I've given you more than a month off without any issues. If you don't get coverage for your shifts, I'm going to have to write you up, or worse. No call, no show status. I lost my cool. Sandy, I'm just getting into the studio. I'm sorry to put you in a bad situation. I really am. You do what you have to do, and I'll be back when I get back. It's just that simple. Bye. I ended the call and took my headphones out in a huff. I'd worked there for three years. I'd only requested time off three times during that time, twice for being sick, and I was back in two days, and one time when I had to go sing at the Episcopal Convention in Boise for the church choir, and that was three days, a total of one week in three fucking years. I'd shown I was reliable and dependable to this point. Couldn't she see the extenuating circumstances? I'd just have to deal with it when I got back. She needed to take a chill pill. Besides, it was her choice to fire Bethany. Now she only had four people to draw from instead of five. Who knows, maybe she'd have to work a shift herself. Oh, the humanity. Poor hotel manager forced to figure out what it's really like dealing with guests on a daily basis. I got into the studio still fuming slightly, but it all went away as I began to record. And by the end of the day, I'd made more progress than I'd made yesterday. Maybe I was going to be done sooner and this whole work thing wouldn't be an issue. I was feeling good that night and decided to spend some time. I was feeling good that night and decided to spend time in the hotel's lounge to celebrate with a drink. I found myself sitting at the bar top drinking my Cosmo and people watching. My eyes and my eye was immediately drawn to a clean-cut blonde guy who walked in wearing a crisp gray striped suit. He walked up to the bar and ordered a drink. I didn't hear what kind, but I saw the amber liquid neat set in front of him. Our eyes met for a moment before I gave a small smile and looked away. I didn't want to be rude. But as I looked forward, I saw him approach in the mirror. I took a sip of my drink so he'd have to say the first thing. I hated saying the first thing to anybody. Excuse me, do I know you? I looked up into his brown eyes and swallowed. I'm sorry? He smiled, nodding. Yeah, you're in that band. You're new, but your song already made a big splash. What was it, five million views in the first day? I think I saw you sing it on the morning show here not too long ago, didn't I? I started to laugh. Okay, this is exciting. You're the first person to approach me who I don't have some connection to. I'm Nick. That's it. Taking back Nick. I'm Tony. Nice to meet you. We shook hands and he sat next to me, facing me. So are you alone or waiting for someone? I shook my head, feeling the effects of my drink. I was a lightweight, especially compared to Casey. Nope, I'm just here finishing up some work on our album. Awesome. When's that coming out? He had a slight southern drawl. Soon. No idea how long it's going to take to get it all finished once I'm done with the vocals. He let out a sigh and shook his head. Wow. Sorry, I'm a little starstruck. You're just... I love your voice. And your music video was really hot. It was a statement about bisexuality, right? I assume you're bi? I smiled, feeling my cheeks burn. I'd never talked so openly with someone I didn't know, but his eagerness was infectious. Actually, I'm gay, but I'm the only one in the band who is. 
the whole video was a statement about people just being people, you know? Not being defined as an L or a G or a B or a T or even a straight, but just living as a person and loving who you love. He nodded. I like it. You know, we might want to do an article about you. An article? Are you a journalist? Yeah. I'm an editor at Out Gazette. We publish bi-weekly here in Nashville. Well, that sounds like fun. I bet my band would love to do some interviews. He gave a small cough. So we wouldn't actually talk with your bandmates? Just you. You said you're the only gay one in the band. Oh, I mean, I guess that would work. I, I don't see any harm. I mean, the band is named after you, right? So it shouldn't be a problem. I finished my drink and poured more from the mixer the bartender had left me. A funny story, actually. Growing up, everyone called me Junior because I'm named after my father. So in high school, my friends and I formed the band and performed a song called Taking Back Nick that was all about empowering Nicks everywhere to embrace their names and stuff. It was totally silly. We performed it at a talent show and won, and we've been together ever since. That's a great formation story. So you all went to school together? Yeah, I've been friends with our bassist, Casey Doyle, since we were in elementary school together. Then we met our drummer, Kennedy Rubick, when we were freshmen. Our friend Levi Skaggs transferred to King High from California, and we all just became friends over love of music. I was the only one in choir, though. They were all in band. Another way you're set apart from them. He smiled, but I didn't like the comment or where his train of thought was going. Do you ever feel lonely among them? I shook my head vehemently. Not at all. We're all really good friends. They've never treated me any differently. In fact, sometimes my friend Casey will pose as my boyfriend if someone's hitting on me I don't like. Tony moved a little closer. Would you have him pose as your boyfriend right now? I felt my heartbeat quicken, blood rushing everywhere except my head. Well, my brain. Blood was definitely going to my, uh, head. Nah. Besides, it's just me here. All alone. And I'll be here all alone for at least another week. His hand casually fell to my thigh and slid upward. And, uh, is there anything I can do to make you feel less lonely, Nick? Woo, that's the end of chapter 11. Oh my, it sounds like Nick might be getting ready to, uh, explore some of the scenery in Nashville. And that scenery just happens to be named Tony's Buddy. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't help it. Um, so yeah, that's all for this episode of Chris's Creative Corner. Next week, we're going to take a look at Chapter 12, The Morning After. We'll see what happens with Nick and Tony. Oh my. So thank you for listening, for tuning in. My name is Chris Cole. This is Chris's Creative Corner. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>